Hello, everyone, and welcome to our top five series for Ryerson's alumni and friends. My name is Christian Mehta, and I am the AVP of Engagement at the University. Before we begin, I want to pay my respects to the Indigenous peoples, elders, and ancestors who cared and stewarded for the land and people who live here where Ryerson is located today. At the University, we've made a deep and long-lasting commitment to truth, reconciliation, and decolonization, and I invite you to learn more about this work online and in person next time we can get together on campus. We know you've got a lot on the go, so this is just a 30-minute webinar. We'll dive in quickly, but before I introduce Dr. Samir Sinha to you, I have just a few housekeeping tips to share. In about 20 minutes, Samir will be taking your questions. If you want to ask something, please add your question to Zoom's Q&A area. Your cameras and mics are off, so selecting the question, uh, I'll be selecting questions from that space. Second, if you're on social media, please use RUTOP5. That's hashtag RUTOP5. And finally, we are recording this session, so if you want to rewatch or share it with your networks, please look for a message from us in your inbox over the next day or two. So now, on to today's presenter. Dr. Samir Sinha is a passionate and respected advocate for the needs of older adults. Dr. Sinha currently serves as the Director of Geriatrics of the Sinai Health System and the University Health Network in Toronto, the Peter and Sheila Godso Chair in Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital, and the Director of Health Policy Research at the National Institute on Aging at Ryerson University. He is also an Associate Professor in the Departments of Medicine, Family and Community Medicine, and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto, and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. A Rhodes Scholar, after completing his undergraduate medical studies at the University of Western Ontario, he obtained a Master's in Medical History and a Doctorate in Sociology at the University of Oxford's Institute of Aging. He has pursued his postgraduate training in internal medicine at the University of Toronto and in geriatrics at the John, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Sinha's breadth of international training and expertise in health policy and the delivery of services related to the care of the elderly have made him a highly regarded expert in our topic today. In 2012, he was appointed by the government of Ontario to serve as the expert lead of Ontario's senior strategy, and he is now working on the development of a national senior strategy. In 2014, Maclean's magazine proclaimed him to be one of Canada's 50 most influential people and its most compelling voice for the elderly. Wow, Dr. Sinha, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Christian, and, uh, and thank you to everybody who's uh, signing in today just to, uh, to catch up on things that are happening related to uh, seniors and aging in this time of COVID. So, so I have the floor for about 15 minutes, and so I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of an overview of what I've been thinking about and what I've been observing, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for some questions as well. So um, as Christian was saying that first and foremost, I'm a geriatrician, meaning I'm a doctor that specializes in the care of older adults. So you would think there'd be many of me out there, but I'm what the New York Times calls a rare and endangered species of physician, mainly because while we've been aging rapidly over the last few decades in particular, um, there's only, there's about 10 times as many pediatricians, so doctors specialized in the care of children, as there are geriatricians, doctors specialized in the care of older adults. And just as, a, as soon as 2016 came around, that was the first year that we started having older Canadians outnumbering younger Canadians for the first time in history. And so really we have a challenge here because as a society we've been aging significantly. Um, and ever since we had our baby boom generation start turning 65, in 2011, people have started to realizing that now this is the fastest growing segment of our population, partly because we've done a really good job uh, living longer and living well, well beyond our wildest dreams, say a century ago. So why do I say that? Well, if you at, were born in 1900, your life expectancy as a Canadian at that time would have been 51 years of age. And when we created Medicare over 50 years ago across Canada, the average Canadian was only 27 years of age. 
and our life expectancy was only in our 60s. So it's only been since then that we've made some incredible gains you know, over the last century, so that now our life expectancy is 82. And the good news is that if you make it 65, and most of us will, you have about 20 years of life expectancy ahead of you, and about 17 of those years are gonna be relatively good health. So that's the good news. And the key is that this whole extra added years of life kind of snuck up on us as a society. Because usually, you know, we would count that, you know, people would work till they were 65 and then they would be dead in a year or two, but that's not happening now. Many people now have this unexpected kind of new period of their life, something that some of us call the longevity, de longe longevity dividend uh, in front of them now. And they're like, what do I do with all this time? So some people are choosing to stay in the workplace. Others are you know, spending more time with family, maybe providing unpaid care as a, as a, as a grandparent to young grandchildren, for example, or, or to a spouse or to a friend or a neighbor. Others might be you know, doing a new degree or they might be um, taking part in, in other things that just enrich their lives even further and maybe traveling and doing other things. There's so many different things that people can do and this is kind of one of these new phenomenon that we're not really sure how well people are prepared to meet the needs of that new kind of age ahead of themselves as well. Um, and, and I think for a lot of Canadians, by having this whole new period of life, it's caught them off guard. Because partly the question is, if you're going to have a number of healthy years ahead of you, how do you want to spend that time? How do you make sure you can stay as healthy and well in as for as many of those extra years as you can possible? And thirdly, the other aspect is, can you even afford to actually live you know, a few years beyond retirement? So right now, when we think about retirement in our society, we know that there are some people who don't actually age well, um, and they don't actually age in good health. And that might be, be because there were things that they had chosen to do or things that happened in their lives at earlier ages that didn't set them up for good health. But we also know there are things that you can do once you hit the age of 65 that can help you remain healthy and well for as long as possible. So things like getting regular exercise and not smoking, for example, um, eating in moderation, um, you know, drinking in moderation, these are all things we can do um, and making sure that we're up to date on our vaccinations. All these things together can actually allow us to remain as healthy um, as possible in those later years. But also we realize that financing our later years of life is also important. And that's why we talk about how the reality is that for many Canadians, uh, many Canadians currently are not retiring with a workplace pension plan. So all of us will pretty much be eligible for the Canadian pension plan or the guaranteed income supplement if we didn't work um, as long as others to, uh, to qualify for Canadian pension plan. But that just kind of helps us exist. Um, luckily, about 30% of Canadians are still retiring on top of that with a workplace pension plan, either what we call a defined benefit or defined contribution, which means money kind of set aside to help them retire. But the rest of us, the 70% of those um, who don't retire with those plans in place, well, we're relying that they save things up through RSPs or TFSAs or other things um, and hoping that they have um, money left aside to help pay uh, for their future years, including possibly their future care. And the reality is we know that only um, uh, on average, those Canadians who don't actually have a workplace pension plan of some sort have only on average saved $3,000 or only retiring with $3,000 in the bank. So you can imagine that for this group of Canadians, um, if you only have $3,000 in the bank and maybe 15 to 20 years of life expectancy ahead of you, aging well is gonna be a real tough challenge. And so that's, that's where we have to start realizing why it's important to think about how we can make sure that people can count on having a healthy and, and long future ahead of them, a future where they can stay in the, independent, productively and engaged, um, and also in a way that they can afford kind of to live and afford the care they might need. So one of the issues that, uh, so these are all issues, for example, that we, we like to research and think about at our National Institute on Aging. This is something we founded at Ryerson back in 2016. Um, and this is, a, this is Canada's first policy think tank, if you will, where we actually research and study kind of issues of, of policy 
um, that relate to how do we can age well, and not just from a health and wellness standpoint, but also thinking about social well-being and financial security. And so we knew a number of different studies and a number of different projects that kind of look at these issues to help try and better inform policy and strategies that can help us age better as a society overall. But of course, for many of us in the last few uh, months, uh, we've realized that our entire focus and attention has been kind of renegotiated by this virus called COVID-19. And certainly that really changed the focus and the work that we've been doing um, at the National Institute on Aging. Because as you'll know, when viruses come along or novel viruses come along, they tend to attack those people with poorly developed uh, immune systems or immune systems that might be compromised because of chronic health issues or other conditions. And so viruses tend to negatively impact young children and older adults because young children are still developing their immune systems. As we get older, our immune systems start to naturally weaken. That's what we call immunosenescence um, and why these are the two age groups where vaccinations are important. Um, and then we have other people in our society who might be living with chronic illnesses. And you can imagine that older adults, many are living and aging with chronic illnesses and their immune systems are naturally aging. And this is why in particular, they are particularly vulnerable to viruses like COVID-19. And in fact, in Canada, the vast majority of our deaths have occurred amongst older Canadians, um, and especially those who are living in long-term care homes right now. Um, and this has been one of the things that the NIA, our National Institute on Aging, has really been focusing a lot of its attention around. It's around the issues of how COVID-19 has particularly affected Canada and our aging populations. Because well, we know that if the average person in, 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 in our country has a one to 2% chance of dying from COVID, we know that when you're in your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, and your 90s, that risk of dying from COVID goes from three, eight to 15 and 25%. And so, but if you're living in a long-term care home or a nursing home, your risk goes up to almost one in threefold is what your risk of actually dying would actually be. Um, and we've sadly seen that 80% of our deaths in Canada have occurred in our long-term care homes. And this is largely because we have an underfunded long-term care system in Canada, where we've actually paid people very little to work in these environments, often racialized women who don't have many other options ahead of them. Um, and then we often, by underfunding the system, we also haven't designed modern day facilities that are spacious enough to allow for good infection and prevention and control practices. This is part of the reason why not only in many countries have many of the deaths have occurred in long-term care settings, but in Canada, we have the dubious distinction where we have the highest rate of our deaths occurring of any country in the world happening in our long-term care settings. That's about 80%. Now, if you go beyond these homes uh, in the broader community, we find that again, the majority of the deaths that have occurred have been in, amongst older adults living in community settings like their own homes. But the difference between a senior living in your own home, which 93% of Canadians are seniors living in their own homes, versus those living in a long-term care setting um, is only about 7%. Um, but still we've seen the risk of death being about 103 fold of being a senior living in a long-term care home versus being in your own home. So it really shows us that COVID has exposed for us as a country that not only do we have to think about how do we support Canadians to age well and independent for as long as possible, but we also have to recognize that our long-term care system is highly vulnerable right now to not only viruses, but it's also not well set up to help us age in the way we aspire to as we get old. So finally, some of the things that we've been working on at the NIA have really been focusing on what should the future of long-term care be? Because what we do realize in Canada is that the majority of our money that we spend in areas of providing ongoing long-term care for older Canadians is around institutionalizing them in care homes. When many other forward-thinking countries like Denmark have actually spending two-thirds of their money helping people age in their own homes and not so much in institutional settings. And here's the punchline, that actually supporting people to age in their own homes and communities is often cheaper um, and is actually more in line with what they want as opposed to putting them into a care home.
We're always going to need to have care homes in our society, of course, because there are going to be people who need that level of care, but we have to make sure that that care is well funded with properly paid workers um, and in facilities that are designed to support things like infection prevention control measures. But we should also be thinking more more so about with more with one in four of us as Canadians being older adults by by the third decade of, of this millennium we need or the century we've got to make sure that we actually have um, things in place so that more Canadians can age better um, in their own communities in their homes for as long as possible because that's going to be one of the only ways we can keep our healthcare system and our spending on long-term care more sustainable and able to support more, more of us to age in the ways that we want to um, as we age. So I could keep going on and on and on, but I want to just highlight some of the things that we think about or the issues that we're thinking about from aging um, uh, as a population and what are the things that we're thinking about as aging um, as, as a nation. But also I want to share with you a little bit about some of our early insights into what we figured out around COVID um, and where we've realized that some of our weaknesses have been and where some of our opportunities to quickly make changes, um, but also thinking about things for the short term, but things for the long term. Because the one great success about building a great society is that more of us are going to age. The question is, how do we help all of us age with dignity and choice um, and making sure that uh, we can have an um, later years of life that we can look forward to rather be than being fearful of. So I'm going to stop there and I, I'm going to open this back up to Krishnan to uh, help uh, moderate uh, maybe some questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Samira. And so much to learn and, and work on um, in uh, other, other health, health issues that may come uh, that we just are around the corner that we just don't know about yet. Um, quite a few questions in the in the chat and in the Q&A, so we'll just jump, jump in here. Um, so Melody asks this question around um, limited staffing and overworked staff in long-term care homes and the restrictions on people volunteering in these spaces. Uh, is it even safe for our loved ones in these homes, given all of these issues and that we've uncovered with COVID-19. Is there provide further color into that? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges, yeah, so one of the challenges that we've had um, was that prior to uh, the pandemic, 80% um, of our homes in Ontario, for example, and, and the majority of homes across the country were telling us they were tra having trouble recruiting and retaining workers um, in the first place in these settings. And partly it's because when you offer racialized women mostly, you know, minimal, you know, minimal wage salaries, for example, and when they could make the same, they, they could do the same roles and get paid far more in a publicly funded hospital versus a publicly funded nursing home, for example, no wonder why many of these homes are having trouble recruiting, not only recruiting staff, but retaining people as well. So fundamentally, you know, we realized that that contributed to significant staffing issues. Um, and what we also don't acknowledge is that a lot of family members and friends were coming into homes prior to the pandemic, and not just for social reasons, but often many of them were actually providing hands-on care. They might be feeding relatives, they might actually be dressing and providing care. Um, these are tasks they probably were doing at home before. And when we actually shut the doors during the pandemic, saying we're not allowing these folks to come in because they're, they're, this, these are non-essential visitors now, what we not only did was we also, not only did we exacerbate a staffing shortage that we had, but we made it particularly worse because now people were getting far less care than they were before. So now certain countries like the Netherlands, for example, but also Quebec, you know, they've actually been inviting caregivers back into the home. Um, and of course, they're saying that if you can, if we have PPE, if you're wearing personal protective equipment, if you're following infection prevention uh, protocols, then yes, then we should, it should be relatively, um, uh, a relatively safe activity. There's nothing that's 100% safe, but something that we can do. And this has been working well in Quebec and the Netherlands and other things. Obviously, if we can't keep people safe, um, then it's hard to make sure that we're protecting the residents, but also the individuals providing this care in environments that are highly susceptible to this virus. So I think there are ways in which we can welcome family caregivers back into these spaces. Um, but I think this is where we've been really challenged 
because part of the reason why COVID was so bad in many homes across the country was the fact that we actually weren't giving PPE um, and the supports that many of these homes needed. Um, and I think now the government, you know, now that we've had over 6,000 deaths in these settings, I, you can imagine the governments are, are a bit nervous about doing anything moving forward uh, because they don't want to make things terribly worse. Well, I think family members, you know, or individuals in these homes who can't get the care they need, um, that could potentially create more excess deaths if we don't find a way to really bring people back in, but in a safe way. Thank you. This, this question is from Suzanne. How likely is it and what will it take to broadly define and understand LTC in policy to be community first and institutional second? The political perspective does not seem to have shifted from the institutional care despite the Ontario senior strategy and ongoing public input. What's your take? You yeah, know, it's a, it's a great point. So I can actually say that while in Canada, 87% of our funding is around nursing home care versus 13% on home and community care. What we do here is the number one thing people are demanding for is more home and community care. And I think government officials and policymakers generally get the fact that home and community care is more in line with what people actually want. And it's actually cheaper to deliver. And one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown is that we have hundreds of thousands of people receiving care in their own homes in Ontario alone and, and well over millions across Canada. Um, and these were actually the safer environments to receive care. It was a less deadly way to receive care as well. So I think a lot of people are now reevaluating quickly what those things are. And the good news was in Ontario where we deliberately started investing more on an annual basis in the home and community care budget. Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada where we're spending more on government funded home care than in long-term care right now. Um, but the government never really told that story. Um, but the other opportunity here is, instead of committing to build 30,000 new beds in Ontario, for example, there's an opportunity to say we could probably save a lot of money um, and deliver a heck of a lot more home care in a more flexible way to people in that, if that's what they want. And I think um, one of my friends recently said was, well, why is there such a desire to build all these new homes and all these new beds? And I said, well, it's because of ribbon cuttings. Politicians love to stand in front of a building and cut a ribbon. Um, and then someone actually joked and said, well, imagine if you did a ribbon cutting in front of every person's home who is receiving home care. That's way more ribbon cuttings for politicians and that might make them more keen to support more home care. So, so I think there is a gradual reorientation happening, um, but you're right, it's been long overdue when other countries like Denmark and other countries around the world uh, made this realization many decades ago. That's great. Uh, the next couple of questions here really has to do with um, uh, one's health in the, in, in the environment or out in the world. Uh, we have a retired uh, professor who um, is 75 years old and given that Toronto is now easing on the lockdown, are there particular precautions that someone should be taking um, that uh, particularly as, as seniors who are you know, at home and perhaps leaving home to just even go to the store? Yeah, no, so this is a great question. So um, so this is this is one of the number one questions I'm getting now is that as you know, as the pandemic hasn't kind of gone away, um, right now we're slowly seeing that the numbers in places like Toronto and Montreal are finally coming down. Um, and that these are the last two major hit provinces where we're starting to things kind of normalize. So the key is that you know, we'll never be a hundred percent sure on, until we have things like a vaccine. Um, uh, in place, you know, whether how safe things are going to be, because ultimately, at the end of the day, a 75 year old has an 8% chance of dying if they get COVID. So the key is that what we're realizing is that th those core principles that we were being taught at the beginning of this pandemic still hold true. We want to practice physical distancing whenever possible, especially with strangers, um, especially when we're going outdoors. We should be wearing masks, um, you know, especially in indoor environments like stores that we might be going into. Um, and especially if you're outdoors and can't stay six feet away from other people. Um, we also want to make sure that we're washing our hands and disinfecting common surfaces. But the key is, is that, you know, as more of us want to start interacting with family members and friends, and especially older people with younger people, for example, that there's always that question as to how safe is it to meet with other people? Well, the key is, depending on 
uh, if these people are part of your family bubble where you're all trying to be safe and protect each other, that's where we're saying you could probably restrict, you know, you can loosen up, you know, what you're doing within your own family unit, for example. So your own family or your own family bubble that's up to 10 people now or, or two families. Uh, but beyond that, whenever you're interacting with somebody, whether it be a stranger or whether it be an acquaintance, for example, whenever you're meeting them, you're almost meeting everybody else they met with since they, la they last washed their hands. And so that risk will never 100% go away. And I think what, what makes people particularly vulnerable is if we're about to start our second wave. And I'll remind everyone listening, we've yet to have a pandemic without a second wave. So many of us are thinking right now it's going to happen in the fall. So yeah, you could take, you could be a bit more risky, maybe not wear your mask or wash your hands as clean, uh, cleanly in, in say late June and July and maybe early August. But by September and when flu season starts rolling around, you know, we're worried that COVID might start getting back into our community and start circulating. So I would just say that be aware what's going on. If you start hearing that COVID is circulating a bit more, um, you know, we don't want people to be trapped in their own homes, especially our older people, but we want people to be hyper vigilant. Make sure that those around you are respectful of your needs, that whether you might be uh, at a greater risk of getting and dying of COVID. Um, and, and how do, you, as an older person, how do you stay hyper vigilant, making sure that there is a reason why you might want to continue wearing a mask or you should keep wearing a mask, washing your hands, doing those things? Because again, these, were our, these are things that will work well to protect you um, from getting COVID and dying from COVID as well. Sorry, if cognitive issues have presented um, as a result of social social isolation, which is what we're regain or restore some of these some of these cognitive problems. Um, you know, uh, is it family visits? Is it friend visits? Um, as those things resume, what what's your take on on ensuring that uh, cognition in seniors uh, continues to um, be a priority? Yeah, so the challenge is, is that, you know, social isolation, for example, when people are isolated, that can trigger things like issues of loneliness and depression um, and, can, and can make people's mental health just worse on its own. So we know that when people are isolated, there's an increase, the isolation doesn't equal loneliness. I have some older patients in my practice who are quite happy being on their own um, and not being bothered by other people. But there are many people who actually miss the ability to contact and speak with other people. And so that inherent loneliness actually is the equivalent of sp smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It can significantly increase your risk of dying. So the key is from that standpoint, from a mental health perspective, if there are seniors in your life, how do you find ways to stay in touch um, and in ways that are meaningful, such as maybe regular telephone calls, video chats, maybe you know dropping some food off at the door and maybe doing a safe visit from six feet away, for example, outside, um, outside their house, for example. These are things that could be all attempted in that way. Uh, for people in your in your li life that might might have dementia, for example, again, you can imagine that isolation um, can significantly sometimes worsen cognition um, as well. Um, and that's why it's really important to try and make sure that we promote as much socialization whenever possible. Um, and so that's sometimes the reason why those essential family visitors in long term care settings or in other ways can be really helpful. Sometimes when you lose a level of cognition, you can't get that back. Um, but sometimes it's important to understand the value of socialization and how that can sometimes help to keep a mind um, strong and, um, and, uh, and supportive as well. That's great. We have time for one more quick question. Um, this one is from Andrew. What are, what are some ways beyond advocating with our votes that we can take part in advocacy for seniors, volunteering with seniors, et cetera? Um, Andrew and I'm sure others on this uh, webinar would love to get involved, but they're not sure where to start or which organizations to turn to. 
Yeah, so I think I think certainly um, if you look at our National Institute on Aging website, you know, this is one thing that we are, you know, kind of building, you know, interest from folks. And so if there are skills or interests that you're interested in doing, we're also the home of what we call our National Senior Strategy. And these are things that where I just say as, as, as individuals get informed about what the issues are. You can do that through our National Institute on Aging website. So if you look at NIA and Ryerson, or national senior strategy, you'll come across all the stuff and then get informed and then talk to politicians, let them know that these issues matter to you and what are they doing about them? Because believe me, when you care about them, they care about them and we get things done. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time for the other 40 questions in the Q&A here, but uh, listen, Dr. Sinha, thank you so much for all that you're doing uh, to support um, seniors in our community, in our country, in Ontario and elsewhere. Uh, you're a, a, a wonderful voice for, for all of us, as well as a great champion for Ryerson University and the National Institute on Aging. And for all of you who participated on this webinar, thank you so much for making the time to join us in this important conversation. As I mentioned earlier, we are recording this, so check your inbox in the next day or so, so you can rewatch. Uh, or you can share it with your friends and networks and colleagues. Um, also, stay tuned because there are more webinars coming your way on topics of interest to you, and we hope that you'll join us in the near future. Dr. Sinha, thank you so much for joining us again, and we'll see you all in a few days. Bye for now.